Listen, he who doesn't remember his past is doomed to repeat it. Because, as a wise man once said, there really is no new thing under the sun. Amongst all the empires of antiquity, there is one that stands out as noteworthy because of its impact upon our contemporary society. I am speaking of the Empire of Rome. Imperial Rome was the first republic, a form of government that was previously unknown in the history of our world. The Bible itself prophesied of this historical fact in the book of Daniel chapter 7. In speaking of the fourth beast which Daniel the prophet saw in vision, we are told in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 19, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others. Then in verse 23, the Bible expounds on this prophetic symbol by giving us the additional information. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. In its natural succession, after the three prophetic beasts or three kingdoms that preceded it, the first of which was a lion with the wings of an eagle, which stands as a prophetic symbol of the empire of Babylon, which fell in the year 539 BC, the pagan Roman Empire was the fourth kingdom from that starting point to ascend to global dominance. And without contest, it vastly deferred from all the kingdoms before it, for with the introduction of a never known before Republican framework for its government, the citizens of its dominion were given a role in the political process. And as it is described in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 23, as devouring the whole earth, treading it down, and breaking it in pieces, so the pages of antiquity agree that the merciless Roman forces, with their infamous phalanx battle formation, obliterated any opposition to Roman supremacy. However, there are several other identifiable attributes of this former Iron Empire that are certainly worthy of analytical observation, one of which was its grossly large number of government dependents. But before we discuss this detestable precursor to the decline of the Roman Empire, it will be more than advantageous for us to take a glimpse at the yesteryears of Imperial Rome during its youthful glory. In its formative years, the fledging Roman Empire was a society that was basically driven by agricultural enterprises. Sheep herders and small farmers were the main arteries of its economy. However, by the second century BC, a major shift for the supposed betterment of society took place. Large-scale businesses began to make their grand entrance into Roman civilization, which in turn spurred a massive boom in immigrants pouring into Rome from many lands, whom were seeking to capitalize on the apparent economic opportunities that Rome's rapid industrialization could afford. And as a result, many sections of Rome became urbanized, one of which was Italy. All that the ambitious heart could desire, the womb of Mother Rome could provide. There was free enterprise, prosperity, commerce, and trade were ever blossoming. And best of all, there was limited government. The successful merchant was a social celebrity. Furthermore, Rome's networks of communication and roads of travel were a catalyst for such rapidity that they could not be matched until the invention of the telegraph, the steamship, and the railroad in the 19th century. 
in reference to Roman law, in Arthur Farrell's book, The Fall of the Roman Empire, he remarks that the benefits of the Peace of Rome, or Pax Romana, include the development of one of man's most impressive codes of law and an administrative system that met needs of men of varied languages, ethnic backgrounds, and cultural traditions. The poet Vigil was not far from wrong in claiming that his nation ruled the world in peace and justice. In addition to this most enviable system of justice, the political military might of the Roman Empire was unquestionably the most dominant of the Mediterranean and Europe. But nonetheless, as it is the portion and plight of all things that are temporal in nature, the magnificent glory of the Roman Empire came to an end. But how may you ask could such a thing happen? Well, the answer is simplistic, however, nonetheless shocking. History shows that the decline of the Roman Empire was due to a major change in the principles of the Roman people. Most notable was the radical shift in their ideas concerning their source of personal income and personal responsibility. In its golden years, the average Roman citizen was independent. As farmers and herders, each individual looked to themselves as their source of livelihood. They ate what they produced, and they profited from what they could obtain from their own industrious efforts in the marketplace. And collectively, the industrious citizens of Rome were the stable foundation of their country's economy. But interestingly enough, as time progressed, the descendants of the once industrious Roman patriarchs found a new viable source of income, and that source of income was the state. The Republic of Rome was the first government in the history of the nations to institute the welfare system. Emperor Aurelian, changing the old practice of giving the citizens wheat so that they could bake their own bread, provided the welfare recipients of the Roman government with baked bread. And not only did the government provide its welfare dependents with baked bread, but pork, olive oil, and salt were also included in their welfare grab bag. Furthermore, Emperor Aurelian, in a landmark declaration in AD 274, declared that the children of parents that received welfare benefits were entitled by right to receive government benefits as well, making these welfare recipients government dependents from the cradle to the grave. But the question arises as to why would the government of Rome do such a thing? Well, the answer to this question is sad, but nevertheless, it's factual. In their desire to maintain control, but more importantly, to invest more power into the Roman Republic than the framework of the Republic-style government afforded, the heads of state sought to subtly strip the Roman citizens of their power within the political process, which they naturally maintained as a result of their industrious lifestyles that made them independent. Therefore, to bait them into surrendering their independence, they offered them the securities and basic necessities that they previously had to rely on their individual industries to obtain, thereby turning a once independent civilization into a sick ward of welfare dependence. And as the people became more dependent on the state, the state became more independent of the people. And although Rome, until its demise, retained the name of a republic, it was evident to even the most unlearned man of society that the beauty of Rome had degenerated into an imperial tyranny. Once the independent citizens became dependents of the state, the heads of the Roman Republic knew 
that they would have the power to do whatever they wanted. Because as the old adage says, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. And lastly, as an extra precautionary measure to ensure that they wouldn't have to deal with any undesirable uprisings of the people, the government provided the citizens of Rome with an abundance of entertainment. They called this bread and circus. In other words, keep the people fed and keep their minds preoccupied with entertainment and the government can get away with anything it wants. Now the million dollar question is, how does this apply to you? Well, if you live within the United States of America, it has everything to do with you. You see, the Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 10, Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. Then, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 15, the Bible goes on to say, That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Simply put, the events that took place in the past are taking place in our present day society, and the events that are going to take place in the future have in principle at the very least taken place in the past. And God wants us to be knowledgeable of world history so that we can better understand why certain activities are taking place in our world today and what will be the inevitable results we are going to reap from these actions in the near future. Because remember, there really isn't anything new under the sun. In the Bible, in the book of Revelation, the Roman Empire is actually identified under a very terrifying symbol. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3, we are told, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now this dragon here in Revelations chapter 12 verses 3 and 4 primarily stands as a symbol of Satan. We are told in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 which says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. However, as we look closely, there is some information contained within Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4 that tips us off to the fact that the symbol of the dragon is used here secondarily to identify the activities of the pagan Roman Empire. At the end of Revelation chapter 12 and 4, we are told, And the dragon stood before the woman to devour her child as soon as it was born. And then verse 5 goes on to say, And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. This man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and was caught up unto God and to his throne, is none other than the Messiah Jesus Christ. We know this for a certainty because the Bible tells us in Psalms chapter 2 verses 7 through 9, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. According to these verses, the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ, is the one whom shall rule with a rod of iron. 